There are a lot of people involved in helping the governor's Portland Central City Task Force do its work. They are tasked with the basic question, how do we bring Portland back? My next guest is on the subcommittee that dealt with livable neighborhoods for the Central City Task Force. Frank Moscow's emphasis is literally on cleaning up the city. He's the founder of Adopt One Block, which does cleanups around the city and provides supplies for community cleanups. Frank Moscow, welcome to Ion Northwest Politics. Ken, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. How bad is it in Portland from your perspective when it comes to uh, litter and graffiti? Uh, it's, um, it's awful. And uh, the challenge that uh, I think we're having is, is that Portland has historically been world class at uh, episodic events, whack-a-mole, if you will, which is it gets really, really bad in a place. We clean it up. Unfortunately, people think that in some way, shape, or form we've accomplished something meaningful, but then you go by there a week later, a day later, a month later, and it looks awful again. And so the question really becomes, how do we move Portland away from episodic whack-a-mole to long-term sustainable solutions? What is a dot one block? What do you do? And how do you compare to, say, an organization like Solve? Sure. So Solve is world class at rallying five, five people, 50 people, 500 people for an event. They're great at that. Um, the question that we want to answer is what happens next? What happens the next day? What happens the week after that? What happens the week after that? And what we've done is we've shipped 9,000 sets of supplies to people in our community so that they can clean up around their block. People are able to, on our website, adopt their block, typically where they live, and are committed to cleaning up around their block on a regular basis. So we're trying to move away from the episodic whack-a-mole approach towards something that is long-term sustainable and uh, <clears throat> will really make a clear and obvious difference over a long period of time. What is the significance, the importance of cleaning up the city other than just from an aesthetic standpoint? Well, there's the broken window theory. Um, there is the, a lot of studies around <clears throat> that people's mental health improves when they are in a, in a neighborhood that is clean, neat, inviting, and safe. Uh, and then also, we're all making decisions on a daily basis. Uh, people on the outskirts of Portland, are they coming into the city? Uh, we all make this decision on a daily basis when we are driving by or cycling by. Do we stop? Do we get out? Do we walk around and do we spend money? Or do we just keep going? And if you take a look at people's individual um, uh, feeling about their environment to uh, the business community, uh, the whole thing comes together in terms of a simple construct, which is... Do people feel safe? And uh, are the places clean and neat uh, and inviting for those people that may want to visit or spend money? You're on the uh, livability, one of the subcommittees of the livability task force right. of the Central City Task Force. Correct. Uh, from your view, has progress been made through that task force? Um, I would say within the Livable Neighborhoods Committee, um, the answer is marginally yes. Um, there's no doubt in my mind that 2024 will look better than 2023. My challenge goes back to the earlier comments, which is we are really going to be spending more time treating the symptoms than treating the root cause. That we are doing more of the same rather than taking a look at some of the systemic issues that we brought up in that op-ed uh, that really addresses ways in which we can make our city sustainably cleaner. Let's talk about the op-ed. You recently wrote that op-ed in the Oregonian outlining your recommendations for cleaning up the city. Uh, what's your number one recommendation? Well, um, there's a lot of recommendations, some of which are above and beyond our control, that are jurisdictional. Uh, ODOT and PBOT and Union Pacific Railroad, the largest landowners, the most visible land that we all see on a daily basis, need to get their act together, stop making excuses and cleaning up their land. Uh, so I would say that's clearly one is, is that those organizations have to stop making excuses and do what they are supposed to do. The second thing is we used to do things that worked and we've just stopped doing them. Um, I'll give you several examples. One, we used to um, have um, trash pickup for most 
residence, city residences once a week. Now we have it once every two weeks. A lot of people that are in the surrounding communities may not know that Portland is the only city around here that has trash pickup once every two weeks. We used to have street sweepers uh, that cleaned up the city. Now the city has a grand total of one functioning street sweeper. Uh, that is something that, again, we used to do that worked that we just stopped doing. The other thing that we used to do was we used to enforce anti-dumping laws and graffiti laws. We have stopped doing that. And then there's another category, which is things that obviously work somewhere else. This isn't new. This isn't rocket science. This isn't untested. Most communities of our size have once a quarter, two times a year, uh, opportunities for people to put really anything that they want at the curb and that it is carted away for them as part of a Department of Sanitation or part of the whole sanitation system that the city provides. Most other large cities in the country do that. We do not. Uh, can we solve the trash and graffiti problem without solving the fentanyl or the homeless problem? Uh, yes, we can. Um, I mean, there's obviously going to be some overlap, to be sure. But uh, what we have done with regards to, to trash and graffiti is that we have made it easy, free, and without fear of penalty to do the wrong thing, and expensive and hard to access to do the right thing. Uh, so anytime you have a situation where it is free to dump trash, it's easy to dump trash, and you know you're not going to get caught. You know you're not going to get fined. You know there's going to be no repercussions. People do it. Simultaneously, we've made accessing the dump uh, hard because you have to either get a truck or you have to hire somebody that gets a truck if you have, like, an old refrigerator or, or a sofa. Right. And so we've made it hard and expensive to do the right thing. Anytime you have that combination of, of, of realities, uh, you're going to get way too many people doing the wrong thing and not enough people doing the right thing, which is what we see on our streets today. Well, as you just alluded to, it's going to take some buy-in from other entities in order to make some of this stuff work. Yes. Uh, how optimistic are you that your recommendations could get picked up by the overall task force <clears throat> and be part of the presentation in December? <clears throat> Um, that's part of my frustration, is that we put together seven, an, uh, seven uh, or excuse me, we put together ten items. Um, seven of those are not being addressed. Three of them might be marginally addressed. Uh, and what's getting marginally addressed are the, uh, what I would consider the episodic whack-a-mole approach. And what's not getting considered are the root cause really fundamentally changed the game to make our city sustainably cleaner. Uh, do you think that uh, the overall work of the task force will make a difference in moving the city forward uh, to where we want to return to? I think, it will move the, I think it will move the city forward. I am not yet convinced that it will move the city forward to a place that we are going to be really happy with. Frank Moscow, thank you very much for being on Ion Northwest Politics. Thank you, Ken.